lifetime, he will ensure that there is not a single Christian in the entire empire. Well, he died a horrible death. And those preachers, some of them died. But we have men and women of God alive today. They're not talking about him, but they're talking about the one he stood against. Because Jesus can outlast any emperor. Could somebody say amen? Brothers and sisters, you are involved in the church. So why, why should we plant the church? I want to begin with a, a scripture in Matthew chapter 16. Most of you know this by heart. It's up on your screen. It should be on your screen. Jesus has this encounter in a place called Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. If you know Caesarea Philippi, where they were, it was a location where uh, they had all these graven images, statues built from different uh, cultures and different people that had come to that region. So you had all these uh, images, uh, Greek images, Roman images. It's a place where all the different religions came to worship. And so Jesus takes his disciples into this kind of a setting with all these graven images all around them. It's like standing in Manhattan and you're seeing these huge skyscrapers. He's standing in Caesarea Philippi and he says to his disciples, among all these things that people are calling God, whom do people say that I am? Some said you are Elias, you know, Jeremiah, all the different names. And he turns to his disciples. He says, all right, I've had enough answers about all the people, but whom do you say? You. Whom do you say? The ones who have walked with me. You have ate with me. You have slept next to me. We've gone to do different miracles together. You've seen the crippled hands, withered hands straighten out. You've seen the dead raised. You've seen Zacchaeus come back into his right mind. And he's no longer a scamp and a robber. He's now a man blessing the community. Whom do you say that I am? And the Bible says, Simon Peter being filled with the spirit of the father. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And there in verse number 18 and I say to you, you are Peter. You are that small rock. And on this rock, the big rock of your confession, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, hell and death, will not overpower it. They will not prevent the resurrection of Christ. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Verse 19. And because of the resurrection, I will give you the church. The keys, the authority of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, that means whatever you forbid, whatever you declare to be improper and unlawful on the earth, it will have already been bound in heaven. Guys, heaven is working with the church. And whatever you loose on, whatever you, you permit, you declare lawful on the earth, will have already been loosed in heaven. Somebody ought to give God praise that you're a part of the church. Somebody said this earlier, I'm going to just repeat it again. The church is the only eternal organism which exists in time but has its root in eternity. There is no other entity on this planet. I mean no other entity. You can call the names Microsoft, Apple. You can call all the royalties of the world and all the big names of the world. There is no entity. That has its operation in time. But its roots are in eternity. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is well rooted in eternal principles. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. So we're going to look at church planting. What are some of the principles of church planting? If the church is so important to God, then the church must be important to us. Why should I plant a church? Slide number three. Why? Why should we plant churches? Anybody want to guess? Why? Anybody? Quickly? Yeah, discipleship and evangelism. But here's key number one. We should continue to plant churches because that was the response of the disciples when Jesus left. They were not happy with just one little local church in Jerusalem. And I say little because it had grown to about 8,000. But compared to population back then, it was small. Is somebody listening? Look at the size of your church, and I mean the people size, not, not the structural size in terms of the building. But look at the people structure size of your church compared to the population of your community. And it will tell you why you need to plant one more church. 
Is anybody here? Jesus gave his disciples that commission to go and plant churches. You know it says that in Matthew 28, 19, Pastor Kent just quoted it, that we should go and make disciples of all nations. Come on, somebody. Somebody say make disciples. It's not just about planting the seed. That's just the first step. We plant the seed. That's important. But somebody has to stay and water the seed. Is anybody here? And when those seeds start to pop up, somebody has to remain there and to take care of the plants. You see, until the seed grows into a plant that begins to produce an orchard of fruit, we're not in the right business. It's good to evangelize. But it's good to evangelize and stay to disciple those who have been evangelized. And there is no better place to be discipled than in the church. Slide four. The disciples responded in two notable ways. Two ways. Number one, they spread the gospel through evangelism and through planting churches. Never forget that. The way of the future of the church is still what we did in the past. To spread the gospel through evangelism and planting churches. Secondly, they understood that go to all nations meant that they were to include all different ethno-linguistic groups, people and languages. Is anybody here? Somebody say people and languages. You're living in a country where you have an amazing inflow of people from all walks of life. I've met with our brothers who came from the Philippines. I just met with our brother who came from Poland. Is anybody here? And I'm from Guyana. I speak Guyanese. Guyanese is simply broken English, missing the adjectives and the verb. Not, not really. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we, we need to address all people groups. Is anybody here? Now, I know, I know a lot of times we have a problem with going to the other nations. And nothing is wrong if you're not uh, the person who likes to travel. And I love to get on planes. And when I get up there, I get to see what God sees a little bit. Amen. I get to have God's perspective for a few hours. Amen. I can see it from the top. Come on, somebody. Say, see it from the top. But I tell you, if you don't want to go to other nations, look in your block, look in your school, look in your supermarket. Right there, you have the nations. They have come to you. And we have a chance. So let's spread the gospel and let's disciple the nations. Amen. What was the response of the disciples? Slide five. The church today is also commissioned to do these two things. To spread the gospel and plant churches in the way that the disciples planted churches in the early church. Same way. Somebody say same way. How did they do this? They went into different villages and they allowed the Holy Spirit to use them. The Apostle Paul who spoke both the Greek and Hebrew and the Aramaic. He went to these different villages and he spoke in the language of the indigenous people. And he planted churches and he left elders, which will also be pastors later on in the New Testament. He left elders to be in charge of the people as they learned to speak their languages. It was not enough to evangelize. That was the beginning. But he left people to water the seed so that the seed can germinate and bring forth some powerful fruit. If you take this course on planting churches, you'll realize in slide number six, it gives you Paul's style of planting churches. Look at slide six. Churches should be planted based on the model seen in Paul's ministry. What was Paul's model? God led Paul to go to receptive communities, sometimes not so receptive, to preach the gospel. And then he appointed elders. Somebody say elders. Every local church still is in need of elders and deacons. You can change the, the label of, of the office, no problem. But do not take away the function of an elder or a deacon in the local church. It is going to be the way of the future. If we are going to take Ireland by storm for the gospel, if we're going to take the UK and Europe and the other continents of the world and the islands of the sea by storm. We must get back to the organizational structure that Jesus left on this planet. It is the way of the future. Could somebody shout amen? Also, we have the Antioch model. 
in which Paul and Barnabas were sent out. This was replicated throughout the entire New Testament. I still believe we can send two leaders into some villages where the gospel has been preached to go and work that community. The area where I grew up in Guyana, I was 16 years old when we left Guyana and my father was very involved in evangelism. So was my father-in-law back then. And so they had decided that because of the rampant spread of different religions in, in that area, they wanted the church to grow. And there was one main church uh, that was spanning a five-mile radius of people. And back then, the population in that area was about 2,500 people. And so they decided to plant seven churches. They planted five, and they had two more to go. And so I was telling Pastor Brian, today in that area, there are seven strong and active churches in that area, that five-mile radius seven active churches it took about 30 years to get it done but there are seven churches that are preaching the gospel in that neighborhood now you we, we i get happy about that but then when i went back there last august and i did some study in the neighborhood i realized that even though we had a success rate that was powerful we are still we still have some ways to go because here's what i found out pastor brian and pastor jeff i found out that we grew from one to seven churches in 30 years with 2,500 people, the population has now grown to 6,500 and we still have seven churches. Here's another problem. We have over 22 bars that have opened up that are attracting the community to go and get drunk, to be addicted, and the church is still happy with seven churches and the population has gone beyond the church's ability to touch it. My prayer is that you will not allow that to happen in Ireland. You will not allow that to happen in Poland, in the Philippines, Ukraine, wherever it is that God is going to send you to. I pray that you will take the Jesus model. And whatever model of church planting God will give to you, maybe it's a new model, I don't know. You take it and run with it. The church is still the instrument through which the gospel is to advance throughout the world. Slide number seven. The church is still... The last point is still the instrument through which the gospel is to advance throughout the world. Somebody read that with me. Come on. The church is still the instrument through which the gospel is to advance throughout the world. Come on. Say that. Advance throughout the world. Amen. So why should I plant a church? Next slide. Eight. Why should you be involved in planting a church? Here, here are some reasons why. Everyone can be supportive of church planting. All of you. Whether you're a worship leader, a Sunday school teacher, a children's church worker, the greeter at the door, the parking attendant, the assistant to the pastor, the pastor, the apostle, the bishop, whatever it is, you can support church planting. Secondly, everyone can be praying for the advance of the gospel through planting churches. I want to ask you for the next seven days of your life, when you get up in the morning, among other things you pray for, would you please pray for churches to be planted and for planters to go and plant churches? Could you make that a point of prayer? If we are the only eternal entity on the face of this planet that can bring heaven to the earth, we need to make it a point of prayer every day. Thirdly, everyone can consider being engaged in church planting. Somebody say everyone. Now the next slide says, how to know if you are a church plant? Ever asked yourself that question? Am I supposed to plant a church? I had a friend a couple of years ago in Trinidad who was with his pastor as an elder in the church. And uh, we were there in 2005. We had a, a massive evangelistic meeting for seven days. 36 people got saved and his pastor planted a church. He was an elder. And... His pastor said to him, uh, do you know if you're supposed to be the pastor of this church? He said, pastor, and he called him by name, he said, the Lord did not call me to be the pastor of this church, but I feel I want to plant a church in another village. So the next year we went back and we hosted, we had another, they hosted another crusade. Seven days again and 20-something people got saved. Out of the 20-something people, this young man, him and his wife, they set out and they planted that church in that village. Today that church is running over 325 souls in a neighborhood that is concentrated with Hinduism, 
obeism and all sorts of witchcraft. Even the man who was involved in witchcraft at that crusade, he came to break the crusade up one night and I, I felt the steam of evil coming against us. So I told the intercessors, lift your voice and begin to pray. The devil has a plan for this crusade, but God has souls to be saved. In that same week, the man who did the witchcraft, he got saved. He repented. He came to faith in Christ. He got delivered. He is now a leader in that church, in that neighborhood. Is God calling you to plant a church? How do you know? No, not every pastor is gifted to be a church planter. A pastor, a planter has certain characteristics and gifts. But there are some steps you can take to know if you should plant a church. Now, I'm not telling you here to approach your pastor and tell him we have to plant 12 churches in this block. You don't need another church in the block. You need another church up the block in the next village, the next town over or something. Now, you need to seek the affirmation of God. Somebody say God's affirmation. Your desire should be affirmed and not emerge, check this out, out of dissatisfaction because your church won't let you preach or teach. A lot of folks go out and plant because they feel dissatisfied at home. That's the wrong reason. God's not going to bless a mess. Hello, somebody. I don't care how nice we wrap the mess up. In foil paper, in gift wrapping stuff and put a bow on it. If the mess is in there, God's not going to bless the mess. God's only going to bless the best. The best in terms of behavior. Come on church. Hallelujah. Some steps to take. Next slide. If you're going to be a church planter, you need to at least, slide number 10, meet the qualification of a pastor. Now I'm not talking about you preaching every Sunday morning. But you should have the heart for souls. You should have a shepherd's heart for people. David spent a number of years in the, in the pasture. He was taking care of his daddy's sheep. But it was not just the sheep that God was training him to take care of and to nurture. God was teaching him how to take care of souls. That one day he's going to be the greatest king. And upon his throne, Jesus will sit for 1,000 years. Come on somebody. Now, are you wired to be a church planter? Now, there's some things you could do. I'm not sure how your church is structured here, but in many organizations, they have a church planting function or department. But I want to encourage every pastor in this room to seek out to formulate a church planting plan. Put it together. And when you put that plan together, announce it from your pulpit. And say in the next year or two, we're going to plant five churches or two churches or one church. Let's start with one. And after you announce that plan, you pray over that plan and say, Lord, I'm be believing you that you're going to bless this plan because this is your plan. And Father, I'm believing you that you are going to bring the planters to help us to plant this church or these churches. And I'm telling you, as God is my witness today, the Holy Spirit is going to move in the heart of somebody that will come up to you and will say to you, or you'll go to them, and I want to be involved in this church planting. Next, number, slide, slide 11. What kind of church should I plant? We need to start a church that's on the right mission. Somebody said the right mission. A church should be driven by joining Jesus on his mission. We're not creating a new mission. I like what Pastor Ken said. There's no new mission statement. Even though I believe in having our little mission statement, our vision statement, it's nice to have it. But the overarching mission was set by Jesus. Amen. Jesus established his kingdom first. Then began adding to his kingdom. Those who were added to the kingdom responded by grace through faith and became agents in the same kingdom. Come on. Should somebody say amen? Hallelujah. In the next slide. A church should be, a church should emerge from a group of people. Who are responding in faith. And check this out. We missed this part. We have a lot of big faith talkers. But check this part. And being obedient to God's call on their lives. It's important to hear God's call. It's important to hear God's call. If we don't hear the call of God. Don't move. What did Moses say? Moses said, Lord, if you don't go with us, we're not going. Are you here, somebody? What did David say? 
David said, I'm going to the battlefield. I'm going to fight this Goliath. I'm going to bring him down. Saul called him in for questioning, are you sure? I'm sure David had the word of God inside of him because he's the one who said, Thy word is a lamp attached to my feet that gives light unto my path. I'm sure he said, King Saul, the Lord is going to deliver this giant. into our David heard from God. If you're going to be involved in church planting, you must hear from God. If you haven't heard from God clearly, don't go out and plant the church. Maybe you can begin to pray for a church planter. Maybe you can ask God to give you that heart to plant the church. And I'm telling you, if you pray about church planting long enough, and you pray about people long enough, God will give you the opportunity to shepherd them one day. It may be a little Sunday school class, a children's church ministry. I don't know, but God's going to call you to do something. Uh, slide number 13. Characteristics of a church with Jesus' mission. Here are two things I want you to pay attention to. First thing, a church must have a passion for serving the hurting. Is anybody here? Now, I don't believe in the church just being a handout center. But I'm going to tell you this. Don't discount churches who are touching their community in tangible ways. Those are the churches that are making, an in, making inroads into the lives of people. Jesus had the crowd listening to him all day. And they were tired and they were hungry. And some were sleepy. Like some of you probably are right now. I don't know. But he said to the guys, he said, do we have any food? And they said, no, no, Lord, we don't have any food. And, and, and he said, you sure there's no food here? And, and, and one of them ran up there, maybe Andrew or Philip. He, came, he said, yeah, Lord, there's a young boy here with his lunch. Five loaves. And two, tilapia. And so Jesus said, bring it. And Jesus held it up. He, he blessed it. He said, now go and give it away. As they started to share the food, 5,000 people, Bible says, leaving out women and children. Back then, that's how they counted it. I don't know why. So there must have been over 12,000 people there had food to eat, and there were 12 baskets of crumbs left over. But later on, that same crowd continued to follow Jesus. And Jesus said to them, you're following me because of the fish and the bread that you ate. He did not rebuke them for that. But then he said to his disciples, you see this crowd following? For the bread and the fish, they are the harvest. Look, they are ripe. They are ready. They may have been following me for the bread and the fish. But they have a need that's deeper than the natural bread that I give them. For I am the bread of life. When they eat of me, they will never hunger again. And when they drink of me, they will never thirst again. And for the very first time, his disciples had a vision of the, sh the sheep that's following a good shepherd. And they were going to be the under shepherds of this great movement called the church. A church must have... A passion for the hurting. You know the whole story in Luke 4 when Jesus got up to read from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. We try to over-spiritualize this passage, but this means exactly what it means. All the explanation is right in here. We should have food pantries. Hello, somebody. We should have feeding programs. We should go to the schools and give stuff out to the students. We should stand by the highways and the byways and tell the drug addicts and the alcoholics there's a better way to live. We should tell broken families that God can be the father in this home and God can be the mother in this home and God can bring the peace of God. To the we can still talk to guys like Pastor Kent and say to them, God has a vision for your life. That's the business of the church. Secondly, a church must be driven to announce, the next, the next slide please, to announce the gospel to seek and save the lost. Luke 19 verse 10, And Jesus proclaimed, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. 
it must be deeply convicted that without Christ, the world is dead in its sins. We use the bread and the fish to get the people to the bread of life. Come on, somebody. It must be deeply convicted that the world desperately needs the good news of the gospel so that men and women can believe and follow Christ. Somebody say, follow Christ. Slide 15. It should also be focused on transferring people from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the Son that God loves. When you read Colossians 1.13, you'll find that. Here's the point of wisdom right there. The gospel is not about what you do. The gospel is about what Jesus did. If you do what Jesus did, you will get the results Jesus got. Can I say that one more time? If you do what Jesus did, you will get His kind of results. If you're not seeing the Jesus kind of results, check your input. If the output is not in line with what you saw in Scripture or what Jesus promised, just check the input. If you fix that, things will get better. Amen? Amen, somebody? I want to jump on to slide number 19, please. Slide 19. We need to understand how, how, the context, how, how to contend and how to contextualize. James used some big words here. Ed Stetson. What does it mean to contend? To contend for something means to what? Help me somebody. To stand up for something. The church has been falling for too many things. To battle for the essentials in the church. To contextualize means to take into account the unique area in which the church is being planted. I think we studied that earlier today. I'm not going to belabor the point. But the importance of contending, contending and contextualizing is this. Certain essential aspects of the church need to be contended for. Jude 1.3, check this out. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exerting you to contend or to fight for earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. I told the worship team a moment ago, I love the purity, the sincerity, and just the realness of the worship today. Come on, somebody. And yesterday. And I admonished our brother and our sister and the team earlier. And Crystal was right there. And I said to them, I said, listen, we have, we have a diluted version of worship in the church today. We have made the place more important than the person we worship. Folks, here's the thing. Don't get involved in worshiping the worship. We do not worship the worship. We worship Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Hello, somebody. You contend for the faith. Fight for what is right. Fight for what God says we should fight for. He told Nehemiah as he was, he was going to rebuild the wall, he said, Nehemiah, you're going to be out there with a trowel in your hand, but you're going to have to have a sword in your socket. As you're working the works of God, Nehemiah, the devil, the enemy will come to try to destroy your, your wife and your family. He said, you're going to fight for your wives. Come on, somebody. You're going to fight for your sons and fight for your daughters and fight for your families. Why? Ladies and gentlemen, there's a real enemy after the church. But my Bible tells me whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Hallelujah. Whatever you release on the earth is also released in the heavens. My Bible also tells me no weapon formed against us, the church, shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against us in judgment, we shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, say the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, we must learn to contend for the faith. Fight for some things. Amen. Slide number 20. Certain aspects of the church needs to be contextualized. To the weak, Paul said, I became weak. You see that? He didn't mean that he gave up his strength as a believer. He went and he identified with the weakness that I might win the weak. 
I have become all things to all men, Pastor Jeff shared this earlier, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Contending and contextualizing goes together. Let me tell you what I mean. Some will make the argument that for me to contextualize, I have to become like the world to win the world. Now don't separate contending from contextualizing. It goes together. If you only contextualize, you will lose your focus on the faith and you will become like the world. And that's not the church. That's something else. We must fight for the faith as we are contextualizing in the community. So we're not going to become the culture. We're taking Christ into the culture. Is anybody here? We don't want the church to look like the culture. We want the culture to receive the influence of the church. Are you listening? Slide number 21. I'm going to rush this through. Pastor, is that my time? Okay, this says 315. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when you plant the church... You need to both contend and contextualize. contextualize. If you contextualize everything, you're not going to preach the pure gospel. If you don't contextualize at all, you will preach the gospel only from your own cultural lens, not from the context of the people who are listening. So here you see how you can put it together. Ed Stetzer did a great job just teaching this. I can't do justice to this man's work, but I'm doing my best. Amen. Next slide, 22. A church planter should contend for the church to be a biblically faithful, culturally relevant, counter-culture community. Bibli biblically faithful means direction comes from the Word of God alone. Somebody say the Word of God. I love my board. I love the leadership of our church. But if ever anybody on my board makes any suggestion that goes against the Word of God, I'm there to shut it down. You might lose some people. Shut it down anyway. Are you here, somebody? You might lose some talented people. But don't push the word of God aside because you want to preserve, protect talents. Culturally relevant means engaging in its culture. And now in the area where we live, we have a lot of people from India, Punjabis, people from Pakistan, people from Africa. And many times in the year, they'll have these reunions at the different parks. Right, the Nigerian reunion or the, you know, um, Bangalore reunion or something. And we'll, we'll send people. Uh, many of our churches will send people into those uh, reunions to dress like them. And to go there with tracks in their language. Biblical literature in their language. DVDs, the Jesus film in 17 different languages. And we'll be there just to share the gospel with them. We're not going there to be influenced by the culture. We're going there... To be relevant so we can bring Jesus to the culture. What's a counterculture community? Members live different lives than the culture around them. Now, there are some places you go in this world where if you're not dressed like the people, you can't be among the people. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? One of my friends he went to, um, to Saudi Arabia. And this part of Saudi Arabia he was in. Um, his mom had gone with him and they're believers in Christ and when they got there they were driving on the highway well the taxi cab was driving on the highway and he was telling the guy which way to go the guy said no are you a Muslim and he said no I'm not a Muslim the guy said well this lane is for Muslims alone the other lane we'll have to take it says non-Muslim if they went on the lane with that says Muslim they, they'll have to wear the whole thing and look like a Muslim. They can't enter that area. That's leading, that's leading to, to Mecca. Folks, there's some countries you go into, uh, you're going to have to dress like the people in order to plant the church and make things happen. Now, dressing like the people does not mean that your heart is aligning with the demons of that culture. Dressing like them simply means you're respecting their culture, but you're coming with the intention to bring Jesus into that place. Now, why are we doing this? Some of you are going to be called to leave Ireland and to go for a week or two in a strange country. I'm believing God after this weekend that a lot of you will feel that burden from the Lord. 
And God is going to give you a country or give you an island or give you a certain culture to go and minister to. And if you go there naive thinking that you can just be and look the way you look to fit in and to make things happen, you'll hurt yourself. Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Let's go down to slide number, okay, let's do slide number 20, 32. Slide number 32. 31, 31. How do I develop a core church planting team? I told you that earlier. Uh, and just give me five more minutes. Can I get five minutes? Who give me five minutes? Five minutes? Let me see. How many give me five minutes? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Do I got twenty-five? I'm just kidding. Some of you woke up. All right. How do you develop a good team? Key one. Where do you find the core team for church planting? I want everybody in this room to think as we're coming in for landing, is God speaking to you to plant a church? When I was eight years old, my mom led me to Christ. I was born in a Christian home, but I wasn't a Christian from birth. At eight years old, my mom called me uh, where we were, and she said, Andrew, you need to give Jesus your heart. I said, Mom, but I'm a Christian. She said, no, you're not a Christian yet until you, you confess that Jesus is Lord of your life and you believe that he rose from the dead. She presented the gospel to me. She scared the hell out of me. <laughs> and she put the Jesus in me. I've never forgotten that day. But from that day until today, I knew that there was something more to life than just living in the natural. When the Lord called me and my wife to plant this church 18 years ago, we, my wife had told me uh, two years before that we had gotten married. She said, I hope you know that I'm not getting married to a pastor. I said, I don't plan to be a pastor. But I never told her I want to be a planter. <laughs> so when the Lord called us to plant the church, she said, did I say I'm not getting married to a pastor? I said, no, you're not married to a pastor. You're married to a planter. She said, you got me right there. And so on the day I got ordained, she also was ordained into the ministry to preach the gospel. And my wife, Pastor Grace, is doing such a great job in the kingdom. But look, look into churches that will try to sponsor out some seed families to assist in church planting. There are some churches that love church planting. And if you as a man of God, if you don't have the resources to plant that next church, as we network together, as we fellowship one with another, share your vision. Amen. And you may need some people to come to your neighborhood. Pastor Jeff may have a family or Pastor Brian or, uh, or, or, or Pastor Barry. Somebody may have a family that wants to plant a church and they can be the seed family that somebody funds to help you to plant that church where you want it to go. All the believers in the community where the church will be planted can join the core team. There's some people who will join the core team for one year or for six months or three months. We had a couple of church planting where people went over for 12 months. And then they return back to their home churches after the establishment of that new church plant. How about the third point there? People from harvest. What does that mean? The new souls that you're winning. Men and women who are not yet followers of Christ, but will hear the gospel as a result of a relationship with you and will become part of that new church plant. Are you here, somebody? I do believe everything we need for the kingdom of God is in the harvest. All the money to complete this building is in the harvest. All the money to go on the mission field is in the harvest. That's why the Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. Soul winning is still the heartbeat of God. Amen. How do you gather the core team? Slide 32. Let's land this. Somebody say home groups. I don't know if people still do this. I think we should get back to this though. If you can't do it in people's homes uh, in person, do it on Zoom. Amen. Do Bible studies again. These small groups could become little core teams for not just church planting, but for other functions in our community. Cultivate relationships with people who don't know Jesus through these small groups. Cultivate the new faith of new believers. Amen. In the book of Acts chapter 42, Chapter 2, verse 42 to 47, we see that home group, cell group, life group model. Teaching from the Bible, fellowshipping, breaking of bread. Worship and prayer was a big part of that. Slide 33, something is on there that speaks to me. That's why I want to share it with you. 
You know, we've had several families in our neighborhood who never heard about Jesus. And so we give them the Jesus DVD. Um, last year, Pastor Ejaz's church, the same year, Pastor Ejaz's church and our church, we give Jesus DVDs and Jesus literature to over 10,000 homes in our area. And I've gotten hundreds of calls from people who said that, who is this Jesus? I've never heard of him. One young man came to the church. He grew up in a Muslim home. He came, he said, the Jesus of the book I read from is not the Jesus I saw in the movie. He said, which Jesus is real? Man, that, he was a church. He was in the right place. He's now in the baptism class. He wants to get baptized. He's given Jesus his heart. Give God praise somebody. Now, people say, listen, people, don't, they don't want DVDs anymore. Well, listen, on the Jesus Film website, there is a QR code. You can send that code to as many people as you want in the world. And when they scan it, click on it, they get onto the Jesus Film website, and they can receive the gospel in their own home. Somebody shout amen. We can still get back into crusades. How about mailers? Pastor Brian was telling us about mailing out to 800 and something homes. How about inviting friends? Folks, invitation is still the name of the game. Somebody say invitation. How about special holiday events? We're big on Thanksgiving in America. Our church is planning a huge Thanksgiving outreach. We're going to be giving out over 100 boxes of love to 100 new families. And we're going to invite each family to come to the banquet at the church right before Thanksgiving. And when they come, guess what they're going to hear? The gospel. Amen. Well, I'm going to close right here because we want to pray. We want to pray. But in closing, I want to tell you this. The final slide, 44. Don't plant a church because you're angry about another church experience. Support other church planters. The journey can be very challenging. Church planters need our support. If you know of someone who's planning a church, give them a call. Maybe give them a hug. Some church planters just need a hug. I'm telling you. There were many days when we planted this church. On Sunday mornings, I was looking forward to getting a hug, not giving a hug. How beloved the church. The church is God's instrument to advance his kingdom. Hello, somebody. Jesus is still building his church. He's looking for workers in his building project. And James said this, don't just plant a tree. Plant a reproducing orchard. Something that will keep producing and producing and producing again. He said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. As we're closing today, you're a part of the most important network of all. And the Global Church Network is great. James is doing a great job. But you're involved in the kingdom's network. What is on the king flows into you. What is on the king does not come through a man or a woman then to you. You have direct access to the king. Would you lift your hands right where you are and just talk to the king for a moment? Just for a moment? Just for a moment? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we believe you've brought us together these past two days because there is a mission to be accomplished in Northern Ireland and in Southern Ireland. We believe there's room for healing. We believe there's room for the healing of the hurts of the past. We believe there's room for healing of wounds that maybe we have helped to create. And we believe there's room for spiritual fortification in this great land. We believe the seeds of the past that were sown, the seeds of the gospel that were sown through men and women of old. And of course, those from the Ashworths family and such like who have sown since in the 1980s. We believe those seeds have found good soil. And we believe as we water those seeds, we believe that there will be germination. And there will be production. And there will be reproduction. And there will be the establishment of the vision of God for this great place of Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. Father, we believe that in your kingdom... 
there aren't any borders we believe in your kingdom we are one in Christ we believe we are serving one Lord we have one hope one faith there is one future we have in Christ and we know Lord today that being Lord of your kingdom you are pouring down your authority upon every servant in your kingdom today and so we come in obedience to your word we come in obedience to what your will is and what your way of doing things are. We come because we want to crush our ego. We want to put aside our logos, oh Father. And we want to pick up what you have to say to us today. As the Holy Spirit, we welcome you to speak in this room. Hallelujah. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just for a moment. God has been speaking to somebody today. Yesterday and today. And you're saying, Pastor Andrew, I feel that there's something in my heart I need to do for God. Maybe it's to help to plant the church. Maybe it's to just go up to the pastor and say, I'm here to help you, Rev. I'm here to help you. Maybe it's to win somebody in your block or to go to a nation, a country. I feel in this room some great things have been birthed from yesterday into today. And I believe the birthing process will not stop today. It will continue on into tomorrow in your churches. And I do believe the stream of revival is flowing. I really do believe that. So right there where you are, if you're feeling God pulling upon your heart about something, maybe you can't identify it clearly like some of the experts can. You don't need to be an expert. But you're feeling God is saying something on the inside, deep on the inside, to do something more. To go another mile. Hallelujah. To get into prayer more or Bible study more or to further your development in ministry. Would you slip your hand up if that's you? You're feeling something in your heart. Lift it up and pull it down. Amen. I see, oh, I see those hands. Hallelujah. I see those hands. You can pull those hands down. Hallelujah. I want us to do something today. And I don't want this to be mechanical. I want us to be relational. That's how the Holy Spirit works. I like you to. Find somebody, maybe your family member or somebody in front of you, behind you. And let's form a group of maybe threes or four people at a time. Uh, you can stand, amen, and just, if, if two of you are there, merge with another two, amen. Let's have group, groups of four, amen. Could we do that for a moment, just for like two minutes? Could we do this quickly? Let's form groups of four or five, amen. You can be more, no problem. But we're going to open up our mouth and we're going to pray today. Hallelujah. If, if, if you need somebody to pray with you, that group is there to pray with you. I believe healing is in this room. I believe forgiveness is in this room. I believe the release of God's Spirit is in this room in the name of Jesus. That's right. Hallelujah. 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 And could you appoint one person in that group to lead out in prayer for a moment? Amen. If somebody needs prayer, just... Uh, let that person say what they need prayer for and one person can pray out. You can take turns. Amen. If everybody can take like 10, 15 seconds and just pray on a point in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Go ahead. In the name of Jesus. 